Hello, everyone. Welcome to Jive Talk. Today, I've got a very special guest. Sturla Ellingvorg is an economist and historian from Norway, currently working on the roots of the Vikings at the Lundbeck Foundation Center for Geogenetics at the University of Copenhagen. And um, in 2011, he successfully initiated an 18-day-long boycott against the Coca-Cola company for their involvement with a Yemeni violator of human rights who sheltered his son from prosecution for the rape and murder of the Norwegian girl, Martin Wieck Magnusson. Stirler has collaborated on genetic research at the Geogenetic Center. And in 2016, he participated in research to find out the origin of Rollo of Normandy. He has carried out expeditions to Easter Island, Morocco and the Black Sea and has looked at the Proto-Indo-European homelands there and in Kazakhstan. Most recently, he collaborated on a large genetic paper published by Nature in September under the title Population Genomics of the Viking World. That's the one that I did a stream about their preprint for it last summer. The findings of the paper have been reported on by a number of mainstream media worldwide, but their reports misrepresent the findings and Stirler has spoken out against this. And today we will hear more about what the paper actually shows versus how the media reported on it. So welcome Stirler to Jive Talk and thanks for joining us. Thanks, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, I've been watching your channel and, and listening to you for quite some time, so it's an honor. Oh, very pleased to hear that you were a fan of the channel. I'm, I've only just found out about your own YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago, but I've been watching quite a lot of your videos in the last two weeks. Um, perhaps you'd like to tell everyone about your, your channel and where they can find it? it, it sure, it's uh, it's called Viking Stories. I, I'm a uh, historian and uh, uh, working with both archeologists and geneticists and, and others. Um, and more and more, I'm working on telling stories. And, uh, and of course, that's every historian's delight, I guess. Uh, but there are so many aspects of it. And I'm feeling this real urge of people in need of roots or some kind of connection to the past. Um, so Viking stories, I think that's a pretty good name, uh, at least for me, it works for me. So uh, I got a few followers there. And uh, and if you want to check out, I'm. I'm putting out some videos now every week or so. So yeah, that's uh, a little bit from my work and from some of my expeditions and, and uh, uh, a little other, other stuff also, but all connected to, I guess, the Viking world, you can say. Yeah, it's a great channel. I recommend everyone to subscribe to it. I've linked to it in the description. You can find that link if you click below. Um, on one of the videos you made was covering the your involvement in that recent paper and uh, countering some of the points that you'd seen in the media. So I'd like to go over some of that, what you've already talked about on your own channel. But um, before we do, I just want everyone who might not be aware to see some of how the media has portrayed the paper before we actually talk about the paper, because that's how the majority of people uh, actually engage with the latest science and findings relating to history and population genomics. They only have the media uh, as their guide. Um, and they trust in it. So let's see what they actually have shown. Um, so quick, do a bit of, um, so here's um, an illustration from a, a Danish publication that of uh, what the Vikings really look like, which is not so strong and uh, not the blonde stereotypes that they used to have apparently. Here are some of the headlines. Vikings were more complicated than you might think. And that's probably true. Scientists raid DNA to explore Vikings' genetic roots. Uh, modern ideas of these ancient seafarers paint a homogenous picture. Their reality was decidedly, decidedly diverse, says National Geographic. Um, this, uh, Politiken is the Danish newspaper who did this cartoon. CNN, Vikings weren't necessarily blonde or Scandinavian. Why everything you thought you knew about the Norsemen may be wrong. And uh, Viking was a job description, not a matter of heredity. A massive ancient DNA study shows. So um, yeah, we look. These and other articles seem to indicate that there, what um, we think of the Vikings weren't a people. And you can see there was uh, the the people on Twitter are going with this. They're sort of um, there's a possibility they 
were black Vikings. Someone, this is based on what they've seen in the Times and other publications, pretty confident about Middle Eastern people of color and possibly African people of color as Vikings. Viking crews were made up of diverse people in the same way to, due to cultural integration. So these are conclusions the people are making based on what they've read. Um, and here I've just got some, I'll come back, oh, they're still uh, in the uh, uh, Eastern uh, step attire. We'll come to that later, but, uh, and we'll look at these figures from the paper later. But um, let's uh, yeah. find out what it really says. So Sterla, um, do you have any objections to any of those claims? Well, I guess uh, if the point is to make a stir and get people to talk about the paper, um, job well done, uh, absolutely. But um, there are so many nuances. Do you say nuances in English? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. In uh, uh, coming out from the paper, remember this is 442 samples over a really large area, and not only geographically, but also in in time, in terms of time, both before and after the Viking Age. Um, so. Uh, of course, you can get a lot of answers, and some of the answers seem a little contradictory. Uh, contra contradictory. If you see um, one of those links you put up there in Denmark, uh, they they say on the one side it turns out Vikings mixed a lot with other people from outside of uh, Scandinavia, and then it says later on in the same paper this confirms everything you knew about the Viking Age and. Uh, there doesn't seem to be that much mixing. Actually, on the contrary, there are very little mixing in uh, Norway, for example, uh, at least far away from these trade hubs. And that's the point, the trade hubs. Of course, everywhere we see trade, there has been um, mixing of peoples and people traveling around these uh, trade routes also. That's something we see way back in the Iron Age also and the Bronze Age, of course. So um, uh, there are a lot of nuances here. I, I almost don't know where to start, actually, to be honest. <laughs> well, um, I think, yeah, there's it's quite a lot of interesting points that the paper covered, as you said, and it's not just about Vikings. It was kind of, there's Nordic Bronze Age and, and some cases, some very interesting, like uh, continuity all the way from Nordic Bronze Age, but other cases, uh, some samples are not uh, so similar to the, uh, the Nordic Bronze, uh, Nordic Bronze Age Scandinavians, but um, like you said, the it's a bit there's nuances. But for example, some of the paper like to let's begin with some of the the, mo the most popular like things that are selling papers, like the hair color. So one of the things that they like to talk about was that the, the we should get away from this blonde haired stereotype and that. Vikings weren't blonde and they were dark haired. But what I saw in the preprint was that it, it specifically said that the the um, pigmentation of hair and uh, hair color and uh, skin uh, color among Viking age Scandinavians was the same as modern Scandinavians. And then in the other thing, in the, in the, more, in the full paper, it said that there were more black haired people, but it didn't say there were fewer blonde people. So perhaps you'd like to clarify exactly what uh, what the paper shows about blonde hair among the Scandinavians? Well, um, first, I would have to say that it's been a true honor to be a part of this team. And uh, I have not been there as a geneticist. I'm no uh, expert in genetics. Um, so I've been a part of this project for uh, the past about two years. Um, but it's a five-year project, right? And I was brought in to look on the um, um, both the historiography and 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 the history, uh, and and the context, of course, also. So so, in that sense, I um, I saw uh, from the very start that uh, there was a problem with the selection of the data sets. Uh, the collecting of the data set. I, I helped there also collecting some, especially in Norway. And um, and that has followed uh, all the way through in this paper. And, and I think we should, uh, we need to be honest. Uh, some of the data sets, especially in Sweden and Norway, is uh, unfortunately a little bit biased. But it's not negative in a sense because we got a lot of new questions. And uh, this uh, means we've got to do more research. So in, in, in that sense, could you elaborate just a little bit? What what was the sampling bias in the in the Viking Age samples? What 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 kind of samples were lacking, and what were overrepresented? Well, uh, we can do, we can do Sweden first. 
all right, for all your, your Swedish listeners. It, I see all, um, some of these conclusions that we only find 10 uh, to, or was it 15 to 30 percent um, Viking in modern day Swedes. Uh, that's yeah, just that's a shocking um, thing. Yeah, yeah, and that's. Um, that, that's due to that bias uh, because uh, most of the samples were taken from the southeastern uh, parts of Sweden and, and not the other parts of Sweden. Uh, the statistics would have been totally different if we had been more uh, gathered uh, all, all around. Um, mm. So that's, that's one example of being a little bit biased. If you see in Norway, there are no samples from the western fjords. Uh, and that's a pretty large area and a very important area in Norway in the Viking Age. That's where all the ships sailed across to Scotland and on the Irish Sea. So, of course, mm -hmm. we don't find that much. Um, oh, yeah, and there's another thing in the paper which is quite important. We see a difference genetically between Swedes, Danes, and Norwegians a thousand years ago. This we didn't know. That's really interesting that those regions were already distinguished genetically so early on and not just like, as you just, some people might assume as modern nations, but also yeah. it seems to contradict the other claims that the at one point at one hand they're saying Vikings were really diverse and mixed with everyone, but then also that they were dis, they were hom homogenous and separated from each other significant uh, enough for them to be genetically distinguishable from Norway to Sweden. So it kind of paints a different picture of this uh, of them being um, of being as cosmopolitan as some of the um the media have claimed and and this is why eski villerslev the the head researchers at the um, uh, center for geogenetics in in Copenhagen, the dna lab um which is called now the lundbeck foundation Ge geogenetic center uh he called norway the rotten banana in in uh, in a danish newspaper uh, i found that quite funny i'm used to be calling it a mountain ape but uh, <laughs> rot by, with rotten banana he means that uh, even though around these trading hubs in gotland and in, in southern denmark that we see so uh, more mixing than than what was expected and we should talk about that mixing by the way also because who were they who came from southern europe and mixed mm -hmm. that one thing but but uh, yeah. the thing when it comes to norway uh, He's, we see in the paper that there's been actually quite uh, not that much mixing at all, not just in the Viking Age, but all the way back to the Bronze Age. And that's, um, well, that's quite special. But we do know we have a lot of Celtic in Norway, especially in the Western Fjords. This we can't see in the paper because we have no samples from the Western Fjords. And the same goes for Northwest England, where we mm. know a lot who settled, especially after the... Irish uh, Viking settlements, uh, three of the four uh, went down. A lot of the Vikings went either down to Normandy or towards the Liverpool, Wirral, and further north area, right? So uh, I wish there were some samples from that area. And I wish there were some samples from Western uh, Norway also, and that's a bias, and we should be honest about that. But it's... Mm -hmm. it's well, and I guess a lot of people in England would have been very m interested to s learn more about our, our connections with the Viking world. I know a lot of people in England are very interested in that. And the yeah. paper just let, let know that the, the English connection to the Viking world is mainly to Denmark. But there wasn't, as you say, not, not enough sampling of Vikings in England to get uh, compared to the Vikings, the other sample. Of the base, it was, there was a, an, under, an underrepresentation of English samples. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, and, and this is also because of this mass grave. And and I know later this year, this new paper... In Salma, in Estonia, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I know later on, this uh, new paper is coming on DNA from Merepton, uh, where the Great Heaton army uh, spent the winters in uh, the 870s, I, I believe it was. And um, and that's going to be a hugely interesting, because then you have women and children also, right? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'd be fascinated to see that. So going back to what you said about the, okay, so Norway was certainly not a cosmopolitan, as a cosmopolitan region, but we see evidence of, in the paper, in within Scandinavia, the integration of non-Scandinavian DNA in other parts. Like in the north, there's some Asian DNA, which we can presume is from Sami and isn't particularly surprising uh, since they are there. But in the south, in southern, the south of Sweden and Denmark, the paper said there was some southern European DNA, but uh, we ha I haven't heard 
some of the people uh, reading the media have concluded that that meant there are Southern Europeans going into Scandinavia, but you have a different view of the possible explanation for it? Yeah, that was actually the reason why I was brought in, to get with uh, a lot of archaeologists. Um, and we, wrote, we all agreed that this probably uh, our um, descendants of the people who once migrated, the Germanic tribes who once migrated out to Scandinavia. Um, out of, I, I say out of Scandinavia, but it was the, in the north, right? But uh, if you look linguistically and go back into the uh, early Iron Age, you see there's a lot of migration out uh, of uh, the Germanic uh, languages. So, so that's why I use the term out of Scandinavia uh, for these Germanic tribes, even the Franks. But my, my, my main point is that we see everywhere in the pre-Viking Age, everywhere where these uh, clans and, and Germanic tribes went out and down south and conquered or destroyed or whichever you want to choose um, the Roman Empire. We see always like the Visigoths in Spain and, and also in present-day Portugal is a good example. They come as a small minority. Uh, they are the ruling class on top of this hierarchy and they marry always into the local aristocracy, right? Mm -hmm. And after a hundred years, their names go from uh, Germanic names like Eirik, the, lo the law code of Eirik in the, in the sixth century uh, or fifth, I can't remember actually now, but, and then a hundred years later, suddenly they're called Pelayo, which was uh, the Visigothic um, uh, nobleman who started the La Reconquesta of, uh, of Spain, right? So mm -hmm. the, precisely the same pattern is what we see with the Normans. The Vikings who settled in Normandy and became Normans, you know, in, in, they, they settled there in 9-11. 100 years later, in, in 2018, we know that the, the um, barons around in Normandy sent their sons to Bayeux because that's where they would learn the Norse tongue. Right, so they spoke French, but they still had a need to know the Norse tongue, most likely for trade, and in in, in 2018. And by then, the names and everything, and and even all everything on their mother's side was um, local aristocracy, right? Yeah. Almost. Everything. Yeah. So, uh, so this, for me, because my 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 own name, Rousel, is a, Nor a Norman name from France, yeah, yeah. Michelle, but my Y Hapa group is a typically a Scandinavian one. So it shows that the, the French names became connected with Scandinavian Hapa groups during the Norman conquest. And I, I remember recently the, there was another paper about um, with migration era samples it was showing conclusively the Lombards were definitely of Scandinavian origin. And a lot the, the expression in medieval times was used uh, womb of nations to describe Scandinavia because it was known that so many Germanic people spilled out of Scandinavia and um, but what are, what are, is not known uh, so well is that there was a gene flow back into Scandinavia of Germanic peoples who had married into other European uh, cultures and then brought some genes back in uh, during the Viking Age. So that's one of the findings. That was one of the main findings in this Viking paper. And we've been discussing this a lot for, for, two, for the past two years. Um, and the thing is, uh, the archaeologists and historians like myself, well, we tend to agree, you know, but we can't say for certain who this, uh, these peoples were. But it's most likely, and we also see some from the east coming into Scandinavia as well, right? So we need mm -hmm. to try to explain this. And uh, that's the next project. And there's a huge project going on. I imagine we're going to talk about that later, but uh, we're following up and we're calling it the Roots of the Vikings. Ah, so that's the project in, in Copenhagen. Yeah. Very interesting. I'll be very interested to see, to learn more about that. So yeah. the spread of Viking DNA was also quite interesting. Out, not, it, it talked about in the, in the spread of uh, DNA resulting in about 5% DNA from Vikings in Poland, um, but they didn't give a conclusive amount for Britain. I think it was an estimate of 16% Danish in, uh, in England and an additional Norwegian. Um, but the Vikings in Greenland um, were not shown, uh, the, they were uh, shown that they had uh, British DNA as well, but uh, they didn't have um, any DNA from the natives, is that right? 
yes, um, the Inuits who came down, they, they were further, further north, and, and uh, the Vikings on Greenland, they traveled north to trade. Uh, tusk, the ivory stuff, was so important to their whole economy, and that's one of the reasons we believe oh. why settlement uh, disappeared, so to say, because uh, ivory from Africa started, uh, which was much cheaper in the 13th century, uh, outcompeted them in a sense, right? But oh. it's, it's that you mentioned Greenland, because on Iceland, there was this paper a year ago or so. I, I remember I have many friends on the Faroe Islands. I love the Faroe people. They, oh, I've been there myself. It's a lovely place. Yeah. So when I come on the Faroe Islands, the, the Faroe they look at me like I'm Danish. And when they understand I'm Norwegian, they give me a great <laughs> family hug. You know, it's like a family reunion. And they think we hate the Danish as much as uh, they do. Uh, it's like being in Finland. The Finns think we hate the Swedes as much as they do, right? Lots of people might not be aware that the Faroese, uh, would, would, many Faroese people would like to be an independent state from Denmark, but they're currently not. And, and they've been searching for oil, hoping to find oil, and having this uh, independence revolution going on at the same time. But as long as they haven't found oil, uh, they, they're not wanting to take that step because it's a pretty long step uh, or a leap. Uh, but I'm mentioning the Faroe Islands just because uh, my Faroese friends, they would laugh at me uh, 10 or 12 years ago when there was this DNA. Um, it was a little bit inconclusive, but uh, th th where it stated that all the women were from the British Isles and uh, all the men were from Norway. And mm. this was funny, they thought. And it's not entirely correct at all. Uh, but this paper I mentioned last year uh, was quite interesting because um, there, of course, we do see uh, some especially women coming from the British Isles and ending up on Iceland. Uh, but we do also see selection. So if you look on the percentage, um, around 1,200, the percentage of Norwegian descendants, uh, if you only look at, at the DNA, the percentage of Norwegian DNA is much higher in the population than 200 years before. And, and this has something to do with the hierarchy of the system, and it's, it's just selection. It's pure selection, right? And, and you mentioned yeah. with, the, with hair color and the pigmentation. I'm glad you, you, you mentioned also the preprint last year because then they can compare, right? And, and I'm not going to be too um, controversial here at all, but I can tell you we've been discussing this fiercely, uh, how to present these findings because we know there is selection. There is selection on height, you know, go to Holland and look there and also most places, you know. And there's selection of the selection pressure. There's selection pressure for pigmentation for lighter pigmentation. Did it was continuing throughout the medieval era. And the, I know geneticist Razib Khan commenting on the paper is saying that like it it was likely that that the the whatever whatever benefits these lighter pigmentation gave to people were continued to be beneficial long after the Viking era and had been throughout the Bronze Age. But um, but then I'm I'm a little bit confused. Why then did it say that the the frequency of the the snips associated with with uh, lighter pigmentation were not uh, uh, lower in Vikings than they were in modern Scandinavians? But I uh, I don't know if you want to comment on that too too much. Too much. Uh, like you're mentioning, it, it could also be as easy as it's it's, it's one thousand years of selection up mm. until the day, right? And if mm. the selection for height, for example, or for lactose uh, intolerance uh, or tolerance, or, or um, we know we have a hierarchical uh, society. We've had it since the Bronze Age, since the arrival of the Europeans, and probably before that also, right? And we know uh, it's a certain dynamic in every society, you know, uh, which way do rich people, wealthy people marry, uh, which way do beautiful women marry, for example. Yes. And, and there are some truths here that, that never stop changing, I, I guess. So we have an I, expression, I, gentlemen, prefer, gentlemen prefer blondes is an expression in England. Right. And, uh, there you go. But, uh, but uh, I, know, I know that the mythology, the, the Rig Thula, it seems to indicate that there was some kind of social uh, status afforded to lighter hair color in Norse society. Uh, but, we could speculate whether that had any effect on the frequency of the of, of uh, SNPs associated with lighter pigmentation. It's um, I know it's I also know it's a little bit of a touchy area for many scientists uh, who um, 
um, are afraid to talk too much about it. And we had also a discussion on this, uh, on whether or not to include it in the paper. And, and uh, most scientists like myself, we are very, very strongly, we feel confident that science must always come first. But there's a way to how we say it, you know, which words we use and, and the whole wording. Uh, that's the way we can be able to make a difference, right? And, and we see, for example, uh, like it said in one you showed earlier, that Viking uh, wasn't a race or no, it was a mix of peoples, you know, and it goes back into the Bronze Age and further, further back. So, so, uh, so you can say it's a hybrid if you want to talk race, but I, I don't think we need to even, right? But it's, no. I, I, it's difficult for many, especially scientists who have uh, students at university and, 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 uh, with everyone maybe being a little bit um, sensitive to different mm. topics. Uh, I understand that it's difficult. And, and um, uh, when, you, when you talk about color and you talk about uh, uh, even selection, it's um, many people are a little bit scared to continue that talk. Mm. I, I mean, um... I can understand. Well, it's obvious. It's evident that that this is something that uh, scientists would be concerned with, with the with the current social climate and uh, the pressure that that uh, people in all kinds of fields are under, um, not to offend people. But uh, I do think it's quite interesting. It's also it's important not to allow the to go the to allow the media to misrepresent things because I'm not a scientist, but. Uh, I take an interest in science, how it helps me understand history because I'm a historian. And I always knew, and I think historians have known for hundreds of years, that the Vikings in Ireland mixed with the Irish and the Norse Gales were a distinct ethnicity. I think it's always been known that the Vikings in England mixed with the English. I, th I think that's, this has been common knowledge for a long time, that Vikings mixed with people as they went to places. And so... And, uh, not to mention Old English. Right, uh, the expression all these to be more Irish than the Irish themselves. Those are Norman descendants mostly, right? Mm -hmm. They use the Vikings. Please uh, yeah. continue. Yeah, so um, the point being that the when the media to use the the findings to indicate that this is some kind of revelation that changes our view of Vikings, it doesn't. And also the indication when they use the term diverse, uh, I think that carries connotations which misrepresent the way that mixing was happening. So we can see that it's not um, an indiscriminate and inevitable mixing, but mixing often happens, it's male mediated. So it's male Scandinavians taking female natives of the places. And also in some cases, not taking them as in Greenland. So they, they did mix with people in Ireland, according to the paper and, and other places as well, but not in every place that they went, um, which is, Interesting, and I remember the other paper from in Italy, the Lombard Cemetery, where they were, they hadn't yet mixed with the native with the Italians. They were pretty much just Swedish skeletons in the, in a in a Lombardic cemetery from the migration that era. Was, which, uh, uh, Patrick Geary, uh paper, right on Lombard. Yeah, a couple of years ago or something. Yeah. And that, but the same paper also had samples uh, showing that the Goths had in, had been breeding with. Uh, yeah, breeding's not the word, that's for dogs, uh, had been uh, intermarrying with um, uh, with Goth, uh, with uh, Hunnic or some kind of, uh, some population in Eastern Europe which had East Asian ancestry, so probably Huns, which is very interesting because the Norse sagas include Attila as a major character and the Huns are a part of Norse lore and, uh, and storytelling. So that reinforces uh, what, what we might expect. Um, and, and we have a uh, famous archaeologist in Scandinavia, she's Danish, uh, Lotte Hedrager, and she has proposed that uh, some of the Huns, after they lost us in the mid-fifth century, settled in Scandinavia. And, uh, and most people would just laugh at that, all, all the scholars, but she's so respected, so you got to take it seriously. So there's more. We just need to find out uh, what that more is and not wow. make conclusions too soon. That's really interesting. I, I couldn't imagine the Huns, I didn't have any idea the Huns would go so far north. Um, but I, I don't know what, what, I'd like to know more about that, that's for sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll look into her, her stuff. Um, yeah, she, she's actually written a couple of books on it also, and she's very skilled in that time period also. 
uh, as an archaeologist. So, so it's it's not to take it uh, to take it lightly or, or laugh of it uh, like uh, um, one would do with uh, someone who's not a scholar like she is. Mm. Um, I saw I got a couple of super chats. Um, they were both directed to me. Uh, I do encourage you uh, to your audience, the audience, to direct your su uh, questions to Stirler since he's the guest today. One of the super chats asked me about uh, wolves of Vinland, and uh, I think I've mentioned before it's a group of people practicing a kind of paganism in America. And I say, good on anyone who who does it. But yet for today, please. Um, Keep the questions focused uh, on the topic and uh, and ideally directed to Stirler rather than me. Um, what what where are we at the paper then? Um, are there any other things in the paper that uh, you thought have been sort of misrepresented by the media? Well, it's um, all in all, I'm very happy for the paper. You know, it's a great study. And and uh, it leaves uh, perhaps more questions than uh, than uh, answers in a sense. And and uh, my my greatest thing had or issue I guess have, have been this bias and the difference between um, southern Denmark and uh, and Denmark I guess and the rest of Scandinavia. And mm -hmm. and they do have a difference, but a lot of this can be explained with geography also. Um, mm -hmm. So, so Denmark so, is kind of like the, the the doorway to Scandinavia. So all right. anything going into Scandinavia is going to go through Denmark. And yeah, and and we see once again we see the importance of trade. And and when I did my masters in, at the university in, in Norway, um, we had these old uh, professors who were of this uh, Marxist tradition, the 68ers we used to call them. And, and I came in there, I remember, and I said, you know, I want to write about Vikings and, and do something on them. The ones who set the Normandy and became Normans, I want to do something there. And he said, no, 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 you can't do anything about Vikings. You know, that's elitist. We should write about poor people in the later Middle Ages. That's much more uh, correct. And I, I, I didn't want to do that, you know, so I continued in my, uh, maybe I should have switched them out. But um, at that time, there were many who were the same, had the same mind. And uh, I wanted to write about trade uh, from Normandy and around. Um, and, and he told me that's uh, capitalism. You can't write about trade. And then I want, yeah, and then I wanted to write about DNA because I, then I had the connection with uh, this uh, 13, 14 years ago. I had the connection then with not only the DNA lab in Copenhagen, but uh, some other places also in the US and, and England. And so I wanted to write something about DNA, and this is what got me into the Rollo uh, project, by the way. Um, and he said, no, 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 DNA is not relevant. You know, it's just some, uh, it's, it's not real science. So you can use it, you can write about DNA in the appendix. That's what he told me. So I couldn't <laughs> write about Vikings, I couldn't write about trade, and I couldn't write about DNA and new technologies. So, and I did it anyway, and uh, the grade wasn't all that good. And uh, that's because we had the system, you know, you need people who can lick you up against your back, is, if that's the way, right expression also in English. Mm -hmm. uh, because those are the ones you want to continue the tradition of who's telling the story. And, uh, and this has changed now, uh, in, luckily. Uh, in Norway and in man many countries, but we do see this uh, almost desperate and a little bit um, scary um, need that a lot of, especially institutions, maybe have to have control of this story or in who's writing the story. Yeah, I noticed a lot of historians and archaeologists too. Um, not all of them, I, I have to say, not all. I'm not condemning all historians and archaeologists, but a lot of them have been really reluctant to take on board all this fabulous new data and uh, the, the resources that the genomics revolution of the last 10 years has provided to these mm -hmm. disciplines. And uh, I, th I think it's often um, the sorts of people that you've described that you, you encountered at university uh, who have gotten used to history as, a, as part of the humanities, very much focused on social questions. And mm -hmm. when you have some hard, Un hard data from you know the geno genomes coming in, they might feel a bit threatened by it, and they don't feel like they control that, as you said. And I, I remember there was an article um, describing this phenomenon, 
phenomenon and comparing it to the barbarian invasions of Rome. Uh, and they called it the barbarians at the gates, referring to the geneticists as the bar barbarians and the, the historians as the Romans. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, um, I, I'm, uh, I'm thinking, um, I mean, I, I said this has all changed, you know, but, but still there, are, there will always be these certain elements there and, and we got to accept it one way or another, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And if we have a society where people are more relaxed and less polarized in opinions and uh, maybe also uh, more um, um, assertive or um, um, n who knows the value, if the society knows the value of your uh, essential freedoms, for example, uh, this would have become much easier. And as a historian, a fellow historian, uh, you know these things go back and forth, you know, like a pendulum, and uh, and I think the, just to say, no, we're pretty close to November third now in the states, but uh, uh, I I believe the pendulum has uh, turned. Uh, the problem is it went too far to the left um, 12, uh, 13 years ago, and uh, mathematically it should go equally right, uh, far to the right. And uh, and uh, this has happened, <laughs> and we saw it in 2005, actually. Uh, and we talked about it also, and this is going to happen. We don't know how it's going to happen, but we've, now we've, we've seen it happening. And I think the pendulum has turned, and we're going towards calmer times, but um, I don't know, man. We'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't say what, what's going to happen, but I'm hoping that I certainly, in terms of his, history, I the, the discipline of history, I definitely think that the these these kind of data and the, and the kind of projects you've been working on, like this paper, are good. And I really love that paper that you worked on and and other similar papers that get hard, really good information about the Vikings, the Indo-Europeans, Anglo-Saxons, all these like ancient migrations uh, that we could only speculate on before. And I remember when I did my dissertation on horse sacrifice in of in among Germanic peoples, particularly in Scandinavia, I so wanted to do comparisons to the horse sacrifices described in India and in Asia, but the that was just a little bit too out there in 2011 yeah. to even compare the Vikings to India, because that, that Indo-European thing was just a little bit not like acceptable. But I think, I mean, now that we know so conclusively uh, through genetics, the, the links of the Nordic uh, Bronze Age culture and the Vi and by association the Viking culture to the steppes. Uh, I think that I, you know, it, people, it, students who want to to make those connections can do so uh, without without being, um, you know, questioned so much. But uh, yeah. I, I, on the subject, can we can I ask a little bit about that the continuity between Bronze Age and um, and Viking Age Scandinavia? Because some of some of the samples seem to indicate that that happened, right? Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting, and and uh, unfortunately, the paper um, wasn't supposed to focus that much on that, since it's called the population genomics of the Viking world, right? Uh, but we do find something there, and that's sort of in continuation with the project we're working on now. And one of the main archaeologists, he's probably the main archaeologist in in Scandinavia, I would say, Christian Christensen, uh, also Danish, um, who's uh, he's uh, very much an advocate now, um, talking about the uh, clans and the chieftain societies uh, and the petty kingdoms that we see in the start of the Viking Age. They go really far back in time, much further than we thought. You know, we we, we see remnants of the same things in 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 the earlier in the Iron Age. But if we have to go really far back into the start of the Iron Age and even back into the Bronze Age. And, and, and uh, we're moving a little bit outside of my area then now because it's not the Bronze Age. But I'm so intrigued by the Nordic Bronze Age. And it's really not that difficult. Um, I mean, since 2015, there's been a revolution in, in papers in, within genetics uh, on... on uh, the migration of peoples and if there was um, um, thoughts and ideas that moved or or if it was moved because of migration right everything like this was settled after 2015 especially 
the kickoff with these two great papers from Copenhagen and and uh, Harvard on the origin of the Indo-Europeans. Um, or, so to, to, to make matters short, um, now we're seeing something totally new and history books are being rewritten now. Uh, we know that the Nordic Bronze Age was a very special age for Scandinavia. Scandinavia was uh, one of the absolutely wealthiest places in all of Europe in the Nordic Bronze Age, 3,000, 3,500 years ago. Wow. Uh, and this was because of trade, right? Um, because the way they made bronze. So like down in, in uh, towards Cornwall, that's close to your area, I, I presume. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right near the Cornish border. This is the yeah. tin mine land, yeah. Exactly. So because of the tin that you can only get in, in Cornwall and in uh, Austria, I believe, on some big mines there, you uh, needed that to make bronze, right, all over Europe. And, and trade became so important in that part of Bronze Age before it collapsed um, that you needed to have these huge networks, not of trade only, but of uh, um, keeping good connections and also intermarrying and and this is from the time period when you know in scandinavia the word for um, getting married and the word for uh, giving a gift is the same word right uh -huh. just like in proto indo european the same right. uh, and that's because it's the same roots also to take poison by the way if i might add but uh, the word is uh, is a uh, gift gift uh, it's related yeah. to our for gift, isn't it? Yeah, Dick Larson, I'll, I'll answer that in just a second. That's an interesting question I see there. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to say, just continue on the, on the, um, on the Nordic Bronze Age there, because uh, it's so interesting if you look on this in the whole new concept. There was a DNA paper that came yesterday, no, sorry, last year, uh, German uh, paper, uh, and it looked on um, why there are no elite women related to the other graves around in the high, higher um, elites around in Europe. What I mean is uh, there seems to be a loss of daughters for wealthy people. Um, and it turns out that they find them up to 300 kilometers away. They marry the way their daughters to keep good relations, right? This is mm -hmm. the gift, marry part, right? Yeah. Um, happy marriage. This is so, the Indo-European thing, yeah. We see, seeing yeah. it in Britain as well with the DNA. They're like s sending their daughters away to be married into other families. Right, right. It's a long tradition, right? And this has been going on. That there you have also part of the selection. You know, what family are you from? And, and we've seen this in Norway uh, among the elites and, of course, in the, in the UK. And, and it goes really far back. And I hope our discussion, our talk here tonight, will actually take us back to Kazakhstan because I have something to say on that also. But Dick uh, Larson wanted to say something about the, the Haplo group I that he was interested uh, yes. in. Yes, I am 253, he asked about. Yeah, yeah I, I am that, actually. That's my paternal uh, lineage. And, and it's quite fun in Norway because up that's until mine as well as I what we call uh, people used to call I1 I guess it's the same thing yeah. right and and, it, and that's a quite interesting lineage because um, for two reasons mainly um, we see that um, the Indo-Europeans who came to Iberia present-day Spain and Portugal in, in a very short period of time almost all the the I have yeah. a <laughs> yeah. Almost all the men uh, who lived there before the arrival of the, the Europeans disappeared, and they've been talking about it. Could have been it could have been the plague because we know plague existed, but the plague. Uh, this is like the Black Plague, right, and the Justinian Plague, Yersinia pestis, right, that bacteria. Mm -hmm. But uh, there has been a mutation there also in Yersinia pestis. So it didn't spread the same. That it wasn't like forty to fifty percent of populations around the Mediterranean would die, and it will, and recurrent every ten years for a long period, right? Um, so we don't know enough about that, uh, and that's also a part of the project that I'm part of in Copenhagen. We're not just looking at, at people; we're looking at the um, uh, bacteria, for example, and, and other um, hereditary. That became an, an evolutionary. It's very exciting, uh, but the whole thing is 
the number is 100% of men who lived in present-day Spain and Portugal before the arrival of the Indo Europeans. There's a paper on this, it's a very interesting paper, um, would disappear after the arrival of the Indo Europeans. Not the women, of course, they, they entered the system. Um, and that must have been devastating to this civilization who used to be there. And the, and the memories surely went on through the, to, to the women and, and, and grandmothers and stuff. Um, and, and, and perhaps this is uh, a solution to the Basque uh, question. Maybe the Basques uh, were some of the survivors there. It could be, absolutely. But uh, I'm not so sure from another paper on Spain that came out last year in February. But um, if you, you saw so we had the number is 100% uh, in Spain and Portugal, present day Spain and Portugal. The number in the UK is 90. Right, so 90% of all men who live before the arrival of the what turned out to be the Celtics or Celtics, I guess you say, well, well the Indo Europeans in any case, uh, before at the very early start of the Bronze Age and and sometime before. Um, so, this process in a, in a considerable short amount of time, you replace a large element of men, and it's not like Charles Mung who would behead four and a half thousand men in one day. Uh, just because they wouldn't become Christians. Uh, this is the start of the Viking Age, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, no, 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 this, there's something more here. And that takes me to the question to Dick Larson, because um, in Scandinavia, we don't see that percentage, you know, because th that, that's us, right? You and me and presumably uh, Mr. Larson there that has that eye. And we actually see, there's some speculations here. I see on the iPad, yeah, they're very strong on that. It's talking about this bottleneck. It seems to be, and, and I don't know if that's wishful thinking. I haven't seen in the papers about it, but there seems to be a, some sort of resistance. Well, I, I'll tell you, it could either be resistance or it could be uh, selection. And we know in the oldest of the Norse sagas, they talk about the ancient gods who used to be people, right? Odin and Thor and all of these used to be people. And they would marry the giants who lived in Scandinavia who were there when the when these peoples arrived, right? Mm. There's a truth to that, you know, because these people, we know they were tall, right? And and they were they were probably uh, fair skinned and, and uh, light pig pig pigmentation and, and blonde hair. Um, because we know 10,000 years ago, there were two different tribes, two different tribes of peoples who would meet around the coast of Norway, and that's where you had... The Western uh, and the hunter-gatherers, was it? The, the Western and the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, right? Yeah, and, and well, well, we, maybe we should call them the Eastern hunter-gatherers, because 10,000 years ago, so the Western hunter-gatherers had lived in Norway, for example, for 2,000 years, and then these other people came, but they came from the north. Right, they, they came through Murmansk, Monsk probably, and down there. And from where did they come beforehand? We all don't know the DNA of the women. And I'm waiting for DNA of the men so we can do something there. But that's when blue eyes and blonde um, hair and, and fair skin met. And this is 10,000 years ago. So it's, it's easy to speculate, and maybe we can do and find out some more research on this. I think uh, there must have been some reason why the men in Scandinavia didn't die out in the same way as in Iberia or in the British on the British Isles. It could have been some sort of uh, regrouping among these uh, in, in our haplogroup among the men in the societies there. Maybe it was geography, they were able to defend themselves. But if you see the different um, percentages of Indo-European origin in the straight paternal line among modern day Scandinavians, the highest percentage by far is Norway. And that sort of contradicts my theory in a sense. It's rather strange. It's not surprising maybe yeah. because Norway is pretty easy to, to actually attack because of a long coastline. You know, it's not so easy to defend as in southern Sweden. So it's not, uh, a, it's not as desirable as southern Sweden because there's more farmland than southern Sweden. I know the beautiful views there and things, but uh, from the perspective of people who have agriculture and pastoralism, uh, the fjords are, are less attractive. Um, but I guess that I1, the problem with I1 is that they there needs to be more study on it because we presume it's from one of these hunter-gatherer groups, but I don't think there are very many old I1-like 
the i2 in is in the i2 is found a lot in old hunter gatherers in britain and spain but they haven't found i1 but it starts showing up a lot in the nordic bronze age in scandinavia uh but yeah. it wasn't I've got a, a theory there, actually. I, maybe I, well, I'd like to share it. I'm actually working on now uh, editing a, a YouTube video on that theory, but I can sort of uh, talk about it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it will be up next week, I think. But um, the thing is, it's so weird. These long, uh, extensive uh, trade networks that they had in the Bronze Age, in the Nordic Bronze Age, before the Bronze Age collapsed, uh, 3,200 years ago. We know the Scandinavians had close contact with the Minoan Greeks. And that's pretty weird. And, yeah. and there, were, there were temples there. And every year, a delegation would come from Scandinavia down to Greece to this one uh, goddess and, and make some kind of worship. And, uh, and uh, we know this because uh, it's recorded that one of these um, delegations didn't return to Scandinavia, and that's why it's written down, I believe, not in Scandinavia, but in local sources. Mm. Uh, but the thing is, something went on. I mean, it's not like in the start of the Vikings TV show where they didn't know about each other just across the pond to England. No, they knew about everything, of course, and down in Greece and everything. So um, something happened in these dark ages that followed the collapse of the Bronze Age. And we could very well see that there could have been some movements, some movements of peoples, and uh, maybe going in northern, uh, north also. So, so actually we could see actually, this, is, this could have been some early migration of maybe even the I-1 uh, going north as From late as uh, yeah. Yeah, the start of the Bronze Age or the Copper Age before that. So, so I, I agree with you. I, if you separate, if you distinguish I2 and I1, um, yeah, it's um, a little bit um, interesting there. And more research is needed. I agree. Yeah, it's a, a fascinating theory. I hadn't thought of, of connecting it to that uh, that source on the Greek uh, on the on the pilgrims to Greece. That I had I did know about. Oh, so we've got another question. This one's from uh, uh, Barium uh, in Norway, asking about Eska Willislev. Yeah. I like Eske very, very much, and uh, and we've always had a great relationship, and and there is a reason why he's been able to get this strong pos position in in uh, within science as he has today, and uh, so I, I I really don't want to contradict him uh, at all, uh, but I will say this: I think all Danish is biased towards Norwegians, absolutely, and and uh, he's Eske is absolutely right to point out that there's a huge difference in what went on in the trading posts or trading places down south in Denmark and in Norway. And we see it in the DNA. So uh, we've always suspected it. And it's, uh, it's actually more uh, than I thought. I thought there would be actually more mixing between Swedes and Norwegians. We know in the area of Trondheim, they had close tie to the Baltic. Um, oh, sorry, did I say Baltic? I meant the Baltic Sea, which we call the Eastern Sea, uh, mm -hmm. because that's uh, there's an old trading route before the trade went down along the coast of Norway to the Frisians. This is in the Mer Mer Merovingian times, just before the Viking Age. But we know beforehand, before that, before their ships got big enough, then they would go uh, with their uh, because people tend to forget up north in Norway. There were there was so much to trade, you know. You had all these uh, not, yeah, not not just just like ivory or tusks on and, and but but skins and and fur and 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 lots of exotic stuff. That when they came down along the coast of Norway um, in in the earlier part of the Iron Age, it would then not continue along these really dangerous places to sail. Where I'm from, it's just north of here where I live. Uh, of course, they didn't take the trade down there. Um, they would go straight east, cross Sweden, because there's an ancient trading route going there, and you see it because there's so many hill fortresses protecting this trading route, yeah, connecting yeah. right onto the amber trade down to the Roman Empire. The amber wow. or amber road, it's called, on if you check out on Wikipedia, and you'll see from the Baltic Sea there. And, and I know you've been talking about the trade with, with amber, but I'll tell you this. Um, we find amber from the Baltic Sea in Tbilisi 
4,200 years ago. Really? Oh, wow. 4,200 years ago. So that's def yeah. that's like the start of the, in the European expansions. Yeah. So if you're ever in you see they have great, great natural baths there and, and lots of good vodka and wine. But go to the National Museum. It's great. And they got some jewelry there that make your uh, jaw drop, at least, and start to drool, I imagine. And, you know, this was they buried their dead with this wonderful ornament that you see the Vikings used to cherish also in gold, pure gold, but they would have amber underneath, you know, and this amber they got from the Baltic Sea. So you had trade routes on the rivers going that far back in time. The first amber in Britain turned up around four and four thousand three, four thousand four hundred years ago. So it's very roughly contemporary, but it's something and it's Baltic amber. So something happened around just over 4,000 years ago where this Baltic, expand the people living around the baltic that they're, they're like expanding their trade routes huge every everywhere all the way to the south the west and the east it's very interesting and it fits it fits with the dna these two papers i mentioned in 2015 and, and many have followed up uh, it says that it was a huge change around 4500 years ago uh, and the whole europe was changed forever you know it's the biggest transformation that happened in europe probably if you count the number of people affected by it mm. uh, until the fall of the Roman Empire, I would say, or till Charles Mangbe started his quest to become some kind of uh, Frankish German uh, Roman Empire uh, emperor, right? <laughs> or till I, I, Christianity took over. Got a couple more questions for you. Um, one, um, uh, another Norwegian, Guren, asks Shouldn't we collect more DNA samples from the north of Norway? as in Norway, almost all burials throughout the Iron Age in the north are exclusively inhumations. Yeah, we, we have a problem with, um, there's been so many cremations, that's the word I use, but uh, I mean, it's so difficult. I'm actually trying to search now to find uh, people from the highest parts of society in pre-Viking age at the moment. And everything's been burned in this area, especially you got these huge grave mounds, you know. And you know they used to before they had uh, um, uh, before they made them into mounds. These uh, late Kurgans, right? Um, they used wood, right? So it's like pyramids. The largest one we have in Scandinavia is in Norway, and it's 180 meters in diameter. This mount, and they used 28,000 logs, timber, 28,000 to build a pyramid over the grave. And, and the size of it is like the mid pyramids in Egypt. So you do actually find- 20,000 rocks. In the north. Wow. But, but they, 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 are, they have mounds over them. And there are so many mounds all over, all around, and that has been uh, discovered. So I want to say this to you, um, what I hope, is that we will be able to use this new technology, like I don't know all this, but we can use new technologies to scan and do the georadar from a drone, for example. That came last year, a drone with a georadar, but it doesn't go deep enough. And the, the georadar, these mounds are so big, so you can't get the georadar down enough to see uh, where the grave is, is, if it's a ship. But we'll soon get there, and then I'm sure we can actually get a lot more skeletons, get a lot more DNA, get a lot more answers. In the Viking paper, there is um, uh, actually quite a few of the samples are from the north of Norway in the Viking paper, uh, mm -hmm. but very few from southern Norway and none from western Norway, which is a shame when it comes to the uh, percentage of Vikings in present-day English, because I'm sure it's much higher. And I got another one now from Dennis. He says, Sterler, why do Swedish Viking samples from the paper seem to be closely closer related to the Iron Age Danish and the Swedish sample the, than the Swedish samples than and Swedish samples than other Viking samples? So why do Swedish samples from the paper seem to be closer related to Iron Age Danish and Swedish samples than other Viking samples? So Swedish Viking DNA is closer related to Danish Iron Age. Danish and Swedish Iron Age, rather than contemporary Viking samples. That's what he says. Why he says, that's what he says. He thinks he saw in the paper, and he asks why that is. Do you think? Uh, it's a, uh, I'm sure it's got a li little bit to do with the bias I mentioned on the data set collected in Sweden, uh, and it's got a lot to do with geography and the fact that uh, southern Sweden, uh, southwestern Sweden, 
Västra Götaland, as they call it, was actually a part of Denmark for a long time, right? And, and uh, I'm sure there was a lot of mixing there, um, mm -hmm. also before the Viking Age. Uh, uh, so I would say it's rather logical if that answered the question. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one. Uh, this one I think we've already covered, but they asked where does I2 originate and is it related to I1 from Nordic Bronze Age? Um, but I think that we, I, I too is an indigenous Western hunter gatherer group, uh, haplogroup, group, but, yeah. uh, and, and it's, it's we presume it has a bronze age. It's probably further back in time than the bronze age, the I two and the I ones yeah. probably came up later, but it's a little bit difficult to speculate without knowing more. Yeah. Um, I'd like now, um, to ask you a bit about on a different topic, your experiences in uh, Kazakhstan and the Black Sea, and uh, what what you were getting up to. If you could tell us a bit about what you're getting up to there and how it related to the the work you do for, with Geogenetics Center. Yeah, the thing is, uh, the, there was a little bit of a uh, cowboy period, I would like to call it, in a sense. That's the time period you spoke of earlier when the geneticists and the historians didn't speak so well together, or the archaeologists. Yeah was this gap and people didn't work cross-disciplinary. Uh, this is all changed, luckily, right? Uh, oh yeah, there we are in Kazakhstan, here. You don't have the whole world there, do you? The whole, no, I couldn't find the whole one. It's good, I'd like to see it though. Those who look like oh, the earth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, um, oh, that's on the paper, yeah, I see that's it. Right. I'll just uh, remove it, yeah. The thing is, in this period, and this was before, uh, in the period from 2004 until 2010, you couldn't really find that much out as I had hoped for. And I, I didn't see historians or archaeologists working with geneticists, and there was this gap. And I was in the middle there because I had no problem working with this. Uh, um, they were even Danish, you know. I've never had a problem with Danish people as long as I can be the mountain ape I, I choose to be. <laughs> um, but the thing is, uh, in this time period, everyone was chasing for exciting DNA, you know, and I, I was more, um, perhaps it was a little more fun to travel around like a sort of India Jones wannabe, being the, the Atlas Mountains or meeting kings of Bulgaria and, and uh, uh, Explorers Club members. That's how I got in the Explorers Club in Sahara. Um, or, or, or being invited to Yemen by the, a brother of uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, Tariq bin Laden, he's the real estate guy in the family, because he wanted to prove the DNA that all the um, uh, people, pe mankind comes from Yemen and not Africa. Um, or uh, uh, this uh, descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, of, uh, he lived in Medina, he wanted me to come down there and collect DNA from all the descendants of the prophets because he felt that the Egyptian descendants probably weren't related and they're making so much fuss. So if you could use DNA, we could like sort them out <laughs> of the family, so to say. It sounds like a fun um, adventure anyway. Yeah. It was really a special time period, those many years we traveled around. And, and, and every time I called someone at the DNA lab, and said, hey, I want to go to the Caucasus Mountains or to Chenia and collect some DNA, and I did. Uh, and everyone would go, yeah, but we didn't exactly, well, it was more important to get the DNA than to have funding to do actual research on it. And I couldn't follow it up. I was a geneticist, right? So it started with being in uh, the Caucasus region, in, in Azerbaijan, in Georgia, and in, um, in Chechnya, uh, Chechnya. And, and um, I think it actually was because uh, we've had this uh, more explorer guy called Thor Heyerdahl in Norway. And, and he was ridiculed a lot because he read um, the Norse sagas literally. And he meant that Odin came from down exactly where um, Snorre, uh, the, the writer of you know, many of the Norse sagas, Snorre Sturluson, uh, in the 13th century, he would write about uh, Odin and, and he would give such a good description. It's almost exactly the way it looks in geograph geographical terms in the Caucasus region around the Black Sea and the Azov. And he meant as uh, he was trying to think as a linguist, though he wasn't, and that was probably his weakest point, um, connecting the Sea of Azov with the Asir 
uh, who went to Scandinavia. And and the thing is, in a sense, he was right because we see a lot of these roots that we see in the Norse sagas are connected to other uh, Germanic uh, roots, but also other pantheons like in, in the um, uh, ancient uh, Greeks um, uh, and the ancient, ancient gods there. There's so many similarities. And now today we know, of course, this is Indo-European. And uh, this one paper that we did uh, in Kazakhstan, it, it, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but um, I'm just going to mention that it shows that there was actually migration eastwards also, not just westwards. Oh, really? Right? Yeah. So suddenly, to me, that was a little bit like a little eye-opening in a sense, just because, all right, so you have a lot of people who not only goes all the time to towards the, the um, west, but they would mix there with locals in Scandinavia, at least, not, not so much in, on the British Islands, right? But, and then they would travel backwards, right? And this is probably why you find among the Kalash people in the Himalayas of India and Pakistan, you find a lot of Lam people, right? Uh, be, people. Yeah, mm. yeah, right, right. Uh, so, so, so there's been something going on here. And, and we had a great experience in the Caucasus region. And, and uh, we, we, I went to see if I could prove some sort of, um, uh, what's it called? A, a theory, I guess, that Tor Heyerdahl had. It was utterly insane, and it didn't. It wasn't right, but we got to disprove it in a sense. Um, but then, I wanted to go into Kazakhstan because of the skits and the Saka that they called there, and the Androno culture, especially. And uh, and it was in. Uh, it's a little bit of a funny story, but it's short, so I'll, I'll take it. So I was in Georgia with this uh, geneticist, young geneticist from uh, uh, the DNA lab in Copenhagen. It was only me and him, and we tried to search for some um, cultures, the culture, the Greek culture of Western Georgia. It was very rich and, and uh, very interesting also, because they, uh, the main city was called Vani. And you know Vani, that was uh, the tribe that lived south of the Acid, right? <laughs> uh, so we wanted to find some, uh, some some skeletons there, but it's so um, wet in the whole area there. It's not not good wine there either in Georgia. So uh, so we, um, uh, I ended up going uh, to meet some um, uh, people from Chechnya uh, across the border there. I didn't know exactly that much uh, of them. Uh, so it was a little bit sketchy, especially since the, we know that at the time Chechens were some of those who beheaded people, uh, down, like James Foley and those stuff in the Middle, Middle East, right? Uh, the ISIS. And, uh, and I, I knew them through the Russian Academy of Sciences, but I wasn't entirely sure who they were. And Norway shares a border with Russia, right? But Denmark doesn't. So it was really easy for me to get a, a visa to get through. But the Danish guy, he couldn't. So I had to put him somewhere while I went, because I had been in Georgia before and I had some contacts there. So I, I, I told my friend uh, the, the, or colleague, um, why don't you go to this wine farm? This is fr a friend of mine. He's American Georgian, a little bit Russian also, and he owns this vineyard. And you can stay there for the weekend while I go for um, uh, 24 hours into Chechnya to collect some DNA, uh, some skulls and teeth. And this I did, and I came back 24 uh, I, uh, with this Lada that went in, the Lada car that went in 160 kilometers an hour. I came back 24 hours later, and I came back into Georgia to this uh, wine farm, and I met my friend there and my colleague there. And it turns out that this archaeologist from Kazakhstan uh, called Sonia, uh, she's part of the paper also, um, she uh, was on that uh, coincidentally on that wine farm being received as a very um, important guest and we all toasted in wine and said next year we got to come to Kazakhstan and that happened actually and we've been there several times later on collecting a lot of different samples because it's a treasure hole with all the Kurigan burial mounds there and not um, a lot of skeletons and and there are so much it's so strange Tom I gotta tell you if you're in the mountains about Almaty, yeah, and looking, you're looking down on the city of Almaty. It's a lot of smog, by the way, um, and and you see, you're standing there, right, and you see down 
towards Samarkand, and you see the Silk Roads going down to India and down uh, through Persia. And then you see, you can almost see the Caspian Sea. And you know behind there is the, uh, on the steps behind you, coming straight up to, uh, to the Black Sea. And every time I've been and met these, uh, especially the, um, the Kazakh people of Kazakhstan, they all say to me, because you have this stereotype of being a Viking, you know, you're from Scandinavia. So they treat me as a warrior, you know, a man in all right. Stereotype we gotta live up to, right? I made a video about it on my channel, by the way. Yeah. But the thing is, so so I meet these people, I hear all the time, I hear one thing. They say, We are are nomads at land, but you are nomads at sea. Yes, yes. And it's so I'm true. Because for them to travel from Almaty across the steps into Europe, I mean, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing for them. As long as they have enough dried meat and horses, it's nothing for them. And the same for me as a sailor living in the fjords here. Uh, for me to travel uh, to Iceland, that's five days sailing. As long as I have dried cod, I'm fine. And, border, of course. and it's five more days to Greenland, five more days to America. It's 15 days total. It's nothing. You know, I don't know. If you saw, I don't know if you saw my theory that I tried to, I speculate about whether the Nordic boat cult in the Bronze Age and that continued onwards was a continuation of this steppe culture of like horses and wagons because you see yeah. horse, horse and wagon burials in barrows on the steps with the, from Yamnaya and onwards. And then mm. when you get to Nordic, in the European cultures in Scandinavia, they start burying boats in a barrow and you have yeah. this sort of like the the boat and the sea are the step of the West in a way like, and the Scandinavians are continuing that step culture, but in a maritime format, that was my, my theory anyway. And what's the deal with all the dragons of the Viking age and the pre Viking age, you know, what's the deal? Well, the Vikings were dragon tamers. That's for sure. Because they rode the dragons at sea. Right. But the thing is, <clears throat> Being in Kazakhstan for so much and meeting these people, they're so concerned whenever they meet people. Which tribe are you from? Which clan are you from? Those are hmm. the two most important ones. You know, the put people in the, oh, you're from there and you're from there. They're all talking lineages, but it's, it's, not, it's not like nine or 10 generations. It's like 20 or 25 generations, right? They have a whole hmm. different concept of both time and distance. And I've learned so much from that. Uh, especially being there in the mountains above Almaty, seeing this whole area, I've done it several times because they have this ski resort there also. And uh, it's, it's really nice there. But the thing I is, <laughs> definitely. And, not, there, right? oh. and not so far away, you have this princess or prince of about 19 years who was buried in um, a, a warrior's, Oh, we, we should put up the photo there. Um, uh, it's a warrior's costume, red and gold, uh, made out of 4,000 gold pieces, all handmade, of course. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is, um, it's called the Isik Kurgan, e uh, I-S-S-Y-K, Isik Kurgan. It's amazing to visit, and you can just imagine, wow, you, you've been buried in 4,000 pieces. Oh, yes, yes. It's Scythian, is, is, that, is that costume? I think I, I know famous um, large hat and stuff and everything you know but, and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. around this area you see him there and there's so many kurgans there it's it, i haven't seen anything like it except being among uh, mass uh, burial mounds in norway and sweden that's a similarity mm. quite interesting so what i've learned is that the map is wrong you know the, the map i got back here oh yeah you got a photo oh that's it that's it that's the prince or princess. They don't know the sex of the person. Uh, buried around 19 years old. And, and all that is yellow there or, or golden is gold. In fact. Really impressive. Yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, about, uh, if I can remember, it's about 3,000 years old. Uh, but I'm not sure if it's younger or older than that. But it's, it's really cool. But it's, I guess, this PCA on, from the latest paper, I'll just bring it up quickly on this subject because you can see here some uh, some people from skeletons from the steppe on there, I think. So you've got Scythians here, yeah. and Rabnaya is steppe peoples, Sintashta is very early uh, mm -hmm. Iranic speakers, Corded Ware, and then 
it's not it's all part of like this closely related to these other europe to these people from europe so i mean kazakhstan and the steppes a long way away but the old bronze age people there were more quite closely related to people here like lithuanians icelanders iron age english people anglo-saxons early norse viking age uh it's all kind of quite close together so it shows an enormous um, amount of continuity over a huge amount of distance and a huge amount of time, actually, which is a story that I don't think the the media was telling, which I think think was more interesting than what they were talking about. I but, agree. Sorry. Yeah, and, and Tom, I, I got to tell you, um, it was so eye-opening to be there, uh, to have been that this much in Kazakhstan. It's not expensive at all to travel there, and it's great to travel. They got a hundred different ethnicities living in the country, also, and uh, lots of people with German heritage for some reason. Um, but the thing is, uh, being among the nomads and being on the steps, which you show the photo with the eagle there, um, and you meet these warrior people, and they're they're pretty much like Scandinavians in a sense. And, and the Russians in Kazakhstan, they are very brutish and they have lots of temper. Um, the nomads in Kazakhstan, they're very similar to Scandinavians in their mood, you know. We don't like confrontations so much. Well, where my family is from, they, they like confrontations, but they're sailors. But, but most, most places in Scandinavia are a little bit uh, afraid or don't like confrontations. And if someone comes and destroys the atmosphere by being too unruly, Everyone is just quiet, and you know, you destroy the. Uh, there's a bad atmosphere now because of you. You've got the same thing in Kazakhstan, but there's so strong warriors, you know, mm. and the strongest warrior feeling. Those with the strongest warrior feelings, they try not to show it because that's the whole. You, you shouldn't show it, you know. You just know you are, and, mm. uh, and it's, it's it's really cool because they talk to us as cousins, long lost cousins. And, and I say eye-opening because I've actually changed the way I look at time and distance from my travels to Kazakhstan. Because, I, I mean, I've traveled all along through Europe when I was younger and everything. I thought Europe was a lot uh, smaller than I, than I expected, right? Well, it's sort of like the same thing. The steps, man, it's like a, it's like a highway. It's the same as out here, uh, outside of my house. Here, uh, we can st stay straight at west, a little bit south, we come straight to Scotland. And if you turn the map, you'll see it's like a highway going from mm. the coast of Norway down through uh, the, um, Shetland and, and the Orkney Isles, uh, around Cape Wrath, the Hebrides, and down to, to the Irish Sea. It's like a highway. And every place you stop, you meet kin. And you exchange news and gifts and everything. You know, It was the same on the steps mm. you know, for thousands of years. And, and so this is important. Uh, if you take away those um, conce the conception you've got on time and um, distance from your upbringing or the civilization or culture that we are in, especially with all the screens that we look at and, and the, the everyday routines and stuff, work and everything, if you if you do it the Kazakhstan way try that out you'll suddenly find the world a lot smaller and people a lot more related and that's a good thing I yeah think. Well, i really <laughs> want to go to kazakhstan after after that uh, report uh, i've got a couple of uh, questions some some people have sent in someone asks uh, the connection between the rise of celtic culture the house that culture and the dorians plus c people i know that's not your area but perhaps you want to have a go you know, I, I'm I'm really not sure. <laughs> so okay, and then here's another I, I, one. The this paper about this: uh, all British men uh, are descended from one man who lived four thousand two hundred years ago, and and um, it was based on a DNA paper. Uh, but but there's been something going on there. And and if I just could add, I forgot to say one thing: the perfect way to spread your genes, maximal. As we say in Norway, or I mean, uh, uh, to optimize the spreading of your own genes. That's to do it not the Viking way, but the Rus Viking way, in the sense. Um, but that's the same way as the steppe peoples did, the clans did. Uh, you would get concubines from all your area. The Rus Vikings did. I, did I the expression now, I think. Yeah. <laughs> get concubines from all your area. And this was the Central Asian way of doing it, right? The Genghis Khan method. 
Um, mm. And when you had sons with one of the concubines, you would raise the son in your own court. And when he came of age, he would be sent back to where his mother's family is from and rule there. There he would get concubines from his area. And whenever he had sons, the same thing would happen. And it's mathematically the best way to spread your genes most effectively. And that's why Genghis Khan and a few other of these clan uh, leaders uh, from several hundred years ago are the ones with the most descendants living today. And that's, I guess, why the Indo-European haplogroups are so widespread, the R1A and R1B ones and, uh, that we see. Hmm. So, uh, someone, uh, Dennis, uh, sent another super chat saying he wanted to clarify to Sterla, I actually meant that the Swedish Viking age samples seem to be close, more closely related to Iron Age samples from Denmark and Sweden than Viking age samples, than Viking age Dan Danish samples are. Oh, I see. So the so so the Danish, so, oh, okay, okay. So the Swedish Viking age sample are more closely related to the Iron Age sample of Denmark than uh, the, the Danish, Danish Viking age samples are. That could be trade. Like the paper says, absolutely. Well, it, 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 the the Danish samples have a significant new admixture that's made them more distantly, more distant than their, whereas the Swedes have, uh, have remained comparatively unmixed. Yeah, it, it could also be geography, something as easy as geography, since it's it's fairly easy to invade Denmark uh, compared to uh, to Sweden, and and. Uh, I would imagine there's something more there um, coming out. Um, but there was, there was also another thing. Yes, there could be a bias because the Danish Iron Age material is very, very rich compared to the rest of Scandinavia. So uh, there could be a bias there also, just to mention that. Um, why, why is it that the Danish Iron Age material is rich? That is it there was less cremation or that the, there were more samples available or...? Well, I, I said it because the archaeologists tell me this. Uh, mm -hmm. But why? Uh, that's the other thing. Uh, but uh, it has to do with something with uh, conservation, uh, surely, absolutely. But also a little bit geography, I think, because I think more... Um, Denmark is a small country. Of course, they have um, uh, done more archaeology in Denmark mm -hmm. and in other places. That's only logical when you think about all the roads and houses and everything you need to fill that small place with compared to, for example, Norway. Um, what um, I think we're coming to the end of this uh, very interesting talk, but I, before we end, I'd like to ask you about, I understand that you've been working um, on an, an American, a, a, a documentary about Vikings in America. Um, yeah. Can you tell me a bit more about that and where people might see it? Yeah, I'm actually working on two documentaries now. One, uh, uh, well, in both, I was supposed to be just uh, sort of like this expert historian talking in, a little bit, and, and we're, we're filming now in a minute with um, in Norway uh, for National Geographic, where they are wanting to make it um, as uh, based on science and as correctly as possible, and I really like that. And, and there, there's this um, famous Norwegian actor, Christopher Hivju, who was in Game of Thrones, to remove the uh, uh, giant span or uh, whatever it was called. Uh, so he's part of that because he's very interested in Vikings. So that's going to be really cool. But we're starting to film that now. Um, so I can't say anything more about that now. But for now, with uh, this Swedish Hollywood actor called Peter Stormare, and Peter, uh, he's been a bad guy in so many movies. Uh, he's been in Prison Break and uh, in Fargo, if you've seen that movie, that great, horrible ending scene. Uh, but he's a great guy. I mean, he's, he's so energetic, positively, and, and um, so nice to be around. I learned so much with him. And he's great about knowledge and interest for um, Vikings and everything beyond. It's just amazing. So um, he wanted me to tell him something about the Kensington runestone, the one in Minnesota that supposedly in 1362 some Scandinavian Viking descendants put down um, far away from everything else. And he wanted me to say something about its genuity. And I, I told him, I, I met him in Hollywood and we talked about this uh, two years ago. And I, I told him, you know, I got I to gotta be honest because 
I mean, they're using the word um, exploration in Scandinavian, which is called upptagelsesferd. And that's a loan word that we got into Scandinavia from Holland in the 17th century. Um, so there's no way I can argue just linguistically, but you, if you can prove me wrong, and that's the basis of the series, I guess, where I'm in the start of the first season, I'm, I'm just this normal uh, historian uh, talking about Vikings, but I'm dragged more and more into the series by Peter and his uh, very, um, interesting and, and likable uh, sidekick, a, a Norwegian-American from Minnesota, um, Elroy, Peter and Elroy. So we're in season two, um, it's airing, season two is airing in Scandinavia on November 8th. And the first season was aired in Scandinavia on Via Play um, in uh, late June or early July this year. And we're planning now the filming of season three. It's been a lot of fun. And I can't say anything about season two because there's a press release coming any minutes and I have to wait for that. But the first season uh, is coming, and surely someone in the UK must see it, but I know it's coming in the States uh, for those uh, US viewers um, uh, in not so many weeks from now. And uh, Peter, he's great. I mean, you're going to love the, love the show just for that. But we're trying to solve a puzzle. And I'm not so interested in helping out uh, wishful thinking. I want to be the serious historian here, working with all the other scholars, seeing. But you know, if he can prove something wrong, uh, and, and I'm convinced, sure, yeah. And that's how we go through the, the TV show, yeah. It sounds really fun. I'll keep an eye out for that. Well, um, I guess I have to thank you very much for coming on, Sterla, and uh, and clarifying yeah. all this stuff, fascinating stories. You, you can, have... can I say one thing? Uh, you mentioned Rollo, and, and that was a long project. I don't want to talk anything about Rollo, but we've been waiting for some uh, extra results that we doesn't test twice over, and that's coming now in a few weeks' Not time. Normandy. Normandy. Rollo or Normandy. And it turned out that these two skeletons of the closest family members of Rollo were not the right skeletons at all. One was 2,300 years old, which is pre-Roman for Normandy. You mm. can Celtic uh, relic, right? But it's the other skeleton. I'm waiting for answer now, and hopefully we can actually find something out after all with Rollo. So I, I'm, I'm real skeleton. Really you're gonna yeah. Uh, very interesting to hear about Norman DNA. It's to find, that would be great to, to see if, uh, what about the Hapler group as well, to see if it matches up with uh, what um, my subclade is or whatever. But uh, yeah, I know uh, this has been really interesting. And uh, just, to cl just to clarify then, were there, um, because some people on Twitter thought, thought there were, were there Muslim Vikings and African Vikings? <laughs> is that favorite code? <laughs> no, no, I think everyone can just relax and, and I think uh, it's um, it, it certainly has gotten a lot of people, uh, given a lot of people something to talk about and, uh, and if you can just relax because there are quite a few professors, distinguished professors who say this confirms everything we knew about the Viking Age. So uh, I suggest you just stick with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's it. Good summary. Thank you very much once again for being with Stella and answering the questions. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you, and I recommend everyone to check out his channel once the stream ends. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks a lot. It's been an honor. Take care. Good night.